are thrilled to have you all here today, joining us from various parts of the continent and beyond. My name is Juliet Mukami, a community manager at Budi and, and an organizer at the Olympics Conference. Um, as we begin the session, it, my, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our esteemed speaker, Aaron Cruz, who will give us a talk on Elixir for automated demand response. He has been on the team building and demand response system in Elixir for a large energy company in Germany, which is based on an experience working in an energy company. Um, without further ado, I'd love to introduce you, Aaron, to proceed with uh, the talk. The stage is yours now. Perfect, super. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Aaron. Um, and yeah, today my talk is gonna be about um, using Elixir at a large energy company in Germany. Um, yeah, and this the story doesn't start at that energy company. Um, it starts, I started a company with a couple of friends, I think in 2017 or 2018, um, called Wiersing. And with the goal of writing software that helps people. Um, and unfortunately we didn't find enough customers in time and the whole company fell apart. Um, still friends. We've gone our own separate ways. Um, one guy's now doing a junior developer boot camp, which I think is pretty cool. And yeah, but one thing that I've taken away from this is there was one project that we almost got um, where it was a data visualization project, as far as I remember. And the point of it was kind of trying to show people, inform people of this thing that I didn't know about, and I think a lot of people don't know about, and I'm surprised I didn't know about it because it seems like it's something we should know, where um, if you're having solar power uh, or uh, maybe wind or maybe you're having coal or possibly nuclear power, um, all of that power that is being generated needs to be used immediately because we don't really have storage for that power. There aren't these giant batteries that, I mean, there are large batteries, but there aren't batteries that on this sort of scale of cities and countries that we can actually store very much of this power at all. So um, there's periods of the day where we have a lot of sun and a lot of wind. And during those times, those are the best times to be using energy, to be um, uh, cooking and, uh, I don't know, using the washing machine or hot water. Because uh, we're not actually storing that. Um, and that's that's not entirely true because there are some pretty cool projects out there. This one is called uh, pumped hydro storage. This works in a way that when we have these low demand times on energy, um, water is pumped from some kind of a reservoir, some kind of a pool of water up a mountain um, or a large hill up to a different reservoir. And that reservoir is filled and then capped off. And in times of high demand, it's kind of just opened up and then gravity feeds that water down, pushes a generator and creates more genera more energy during these, these um, high demand times, which I think is pretty, it's pretty wacky. <laughs> I think it's a pretty, pretty interesting solution. I really like it. And there's other things like this coming out, but in general, like, I've talked to these people at at the company that I'm working for, and they're like, we can't store it. Like it doesn't, it's not possible with technology that we have today. Um, so there's this idea of like, you, you can have, you can see here that throughout the day and throughout the year, things change quite a bit with as far as how much energy is available. Um, they're also turning plants on and off and, and these uh, overflow plants also on and off. But you have this like during the midday, you have the most solar on during storms, during windy days, you have the most wind. And there's these times where it just, we should be using energy during these times. Um, at night, we're missing out on all of those possibilities. Um, so it's, it's good to use less energy at night. So we, we kind of have this situation here where it would be nice if, we could 
regulate how much energy we use based on these types of things that are happening, based on the weather, based on maybe how far away you are. Um, maybe it's there's a lot of uh, it's flooding and there's a lot of hydroelectric power at the time. And the way that this problem is being solved right now is not to focus on the supply side, which we've always done, where it's like pushing more energy into the network from the power plants. It's more on the demand side with these kinds of smart technologies, like uh, where you can set up your house to have a solar panel and batteries and uh, maybe a wind, <laughs> a windmill outside. And um, I don't know what that's supposed to be in this situation. Maybe there's personal windmills and you can have these smart grids that will switch between the, these different things, depending on what you have more of, if you have a lower storage or more storage. Yeah. So this is kind of what this automated um, demand response is, is in a, in a nutshell. Um, yeah. So just a, an intro to me real quick. Um, you can find me, Mr. Aaron Cruz on GitHub and on Twitter. Um, I am, I've been freelancing for like 13 years. I have a podcast about how to find more clients as a freelancer. Um, this is a, a QR code to my link tree with the slides to this talk are also there. Um, but I'll show it again at the end. So you don't, I know everyone's running and grabbing their phone and, and pointing it at their computer screen right now, but you can wait till the end as well. And, uh, I organize a bunch of meetups, um, most Interesting to me now is the, the Elixir meetup in Vienna, Austria, and um, the Freelancing in Vienna meetup. And those are now in person, which is really, really nice. Um, and I have been streaming Elixir and some Python stuff. I've been playing with these large language models a little bit with OpenAI. And um, on my last video from my stream, you can watch me build a chat GPT plugin from scratch. Maybe I have like a Phoenix scaffolding up. Um, and yeah, with a, a Phoenix application and, um, yeah, it's fun. I, I'd like it. I, I want to do it more in the future. I also spoke at, um, RubyConf Kenya twice. And, um, I heard Sigu say yesterday that they're doing an in-person Elixir meetup or an Elixir conference. And the first thing I looked at my wife and I was like, uh, honey, I might be going to Nairobi next year. And she was like, very interesting, huh? So yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Like I, I, that's super cool that you guys are doing that again. And yeah, I, I would love to, to head down as an attendee if, if possible. Yeah, so I also have a confession to make. Um, this energy company that I'm working for is um, in Germany and it's the first contract I've ever had where it was um, not in my first language. So all of the communication is done in German. And um, I know that a lot of people here can relate to that. It's like not working in their native language. And as my first experience doing that, holy crap, it is not very fun. And I, um, I salute you <laughs> for having done it for a long time, probably. Um, yeah. So in, in so, I... I'm, I might have made a, a buzzword mistake, and it turns out that the, the topic that I've been working in isn't actually automated demand response. Um, <laughs> so this talk isn't going to be about uh, automated, demand, uh, automated demand response. I, I thought it would be fun to intro it because I think it's a super interesting topic. But what my topic's actually about is Redispatch 2.0, which is this um, kind of standard in Europe for the future of how we deal with um, kind of net congestion and things in the energy networks in, in Europe. And it's another buzzword, of course. Um, so yeah, what, what is it? And if you look at a map of kind of the energy network of Germany, um, how it used to be, or of, of, of most countries, it was this situation where you had all of these coal plants and maybe some nuclear power plants. They don't have those in Germany anymore. You have these hydro plants, oil, all of these kind of, you know where they are. It takes a bunch of years for them to be built and they're very regulated and you, you, it's easy. You have like all a few places flowing in with energy. Um, but in 
in the meantime, we've started getting more of these offshore wind parks, um, other on land wind parks. We have the solar parks. We have these other things happening where the these large factories are actually pushing energy back into the grid. So, and then you, if you look at the, at the bottom level here, you actually have people that are like, I was talking about uh, where you can generate energy and push it back into the grid yourself. I almost rented a house up the road from here where we would have had our own solar panel where we could push energy back into the grid and get paid for it. So you have this from the simple concept, the simple network to this, everything coming from everywhere type of thing. And if we look real quick, I think I can show this. This is a map of kind of these energy sources in Germany right now. And you can see that this map looks a little bit more uh, complicated, a little bit more complex than the, the last map that I just showed you. So this, this can cause some problems. And um, the main problem being that there's lots of congestion in the network. And with congestion, you end up with these problems where you have outages, you have transformers, generators exploding. Um, your high voltage lines can only carry so much energy. So um, you can have really, really bad times, blackouts. We don't want blackouts, they're bad. But there are some solutions that we have to it. Um, what we're doing with Redispatch 2.0 is one of them. Um, and it uses neural networks, not this uh, new, super interesting, fun LLM stuff that we're doing now, but more of these predictive models from a few years ago, these um, recurrent neural networks, probably a lot of Python. Um, and yeah, we're using this to kind of make predictions about what the congestion will look like tomorrow based on data from the last few years. Um, and that makes it so that the energy producers are faster and they're already ready to kind of switch over to this. Um, it, it takes a lot of money to power up a power station if you have a high demand all of a sudden, um, and especially for unexpected demand. You have to get the turbines running. You need to heat up whatever medium you're using to turn them to make the steam. So it's it's you can save a lot of money by having more of an idea of what's happening in the future. You also waste less energy because one of the other solutions is just to push as much energy into the network as possible. Um, so you don't have brownouts, so you don't have issues. So um, this really helps with with that. And what the rest of this talk is going to be about is, what I've learned over the last year working as a as a pretty much full full time back end developer, I've been doing full stack for the last like twelve years. Um, and I wrote my first React code on this project last week, and the rest of it has all been um, elixir, except maybe a tiny bit of of live view here and there um, if I'm talking full stack, but it's all been elixir the whole time. And I've learned a lot about testing OTP. Um, uh, I want to give kind of a little anecdote about Let It Crash. And I was going to talk about umbrella projects, but I think that I don't have enough time. If there's some magical thing happens and I have enough time, I can jump over to uh, uh, some other slides that I have about umbrella projects. We have a lot of umbrella projects in this application that I've been working in, like uh, an obscene amount. Um, so I, I, I'm a little familiar with them, um, but this talk is mostly going to be about testing because um, what I found is the more that I work with Elixir, the it makes these things like creating these distributed systems, creating systems kind of that, that communicate with each other uh, very simple. It's like unbelievable how simple it is to create kind of a distributed system. But in that it turns out where most of the complexity I found has been all around testing and especially testing OTP. So most of this is going to be about kind of like tips, I guess, that I have that I've learned from having to test OTP. And yeah, so let's just jump right into some testing. So one thing that we use quite a bit in our code base are these kind of test case helper files. 
Um, and the way you use one is you use it. So there's this, this module called um, X unit case template that you can use in your, in your test files. And that gives you access to using this async true. It's essentially delegating. Normally what you would do at the top of a test file is write use X unit dot test or X unit dot case is what it's called. And then you have options. And one of the options is async true, for example. Um, yeah. So what, what the X, X unit case template allows you to do is kind of wrap that in your own helper file, essentially, that gives you kind of access to some helpers based around making testing easier. Um, you can see, so let's, let's go, like, we're using the setup, which is coming from the pool case. And also this tag is going to be something that we're, we're looking at inside of this pool case. Um, and so this is the pool case itself. You can see that we use X unit case template. We also get this, a couple of, of macros to play around with. We get this, um, this using macro, which is just, I think a very, very light wrapper around def macro double underscore using, um, but it's fun to use, I guess. And then we get this, the setup macro, like we also have uh, in, in our tests themselves. Um, and the first thing that we're gonna look at is how you can use tags. Um, I'm not super proud of this in the, the setup function where the tags are being piped into a function just by themselves instead of it being more of a pipeline. I like to follow Credo's thing where it's like, if you have one thing going into a thing, just turn into a function call on tags. But um, the example that I pulled this from, there were multiple maybe set up something. So I just left it there as a, hey, maybe you have multiple steps. So this is what that maybe set up PubSub does. It takes tags. Tags is your text con your test context. This thing that if you're if you're writing test something in quotes, the description of the test, and then comma a map. That map that you can use that you use in your setup is this um, this thing we're pattern matching on this context. And what it's saying is if there is this key in the context, then we're going to do something. If there is no key or like if anything else happens, we're just going to give the context back and do nothing. And that's why these functions are generally named maybe because we might just do nothing. Um, and what that looks like in the test itself is this, this tag. Um, when you tag this, that will immediately or that will then in this case file be um, pushed down through the setup tags down into these functions. So in this situation, we would be setting up our PubSub server. So we also have these two other things. We have this using, which quotes and imports this module itself, all of the functions, the public functions of this module itself into the, the, the function, into the, the, the sorry, the file or the, the module that uses it. Um, so in this case, we would get this setup process pool, this function at the bottom that's, that's wrapped in red. Um, and, yeah, so we would get that as like a, that would exist inside of the test file. And the way we would use that is with the setup macro, and then you can have a single thing, you can give setup a block, you can give setup uh, an atom, or you can give setup a list of atoms. And what this means is look for a local function called setup process pool and call it, giving it the current text context as the first argument. So setup process pool is just, it's just a function. Um, if you've ever used uh, these like plugs inside of um, like a Phoenix router, it's the same concept. It's really like, this is a named function. And you can see again, it's the function on the bottom that's being called. We received the context. In my little play example file here, I'm, um, I'm creating this, I can either give it a name, I can give a name into the context inside the setup um, and then start supervised my process pool, giving it that name, or I can default to just a default name. And then the other thing that is important about these setup functions is they need to return 
this is, a, I find this really strange, uh, but from your setup block, you can return either an okay atom, I think probably an error atom too. Um, and then the other options are a tuple with okay as the first item, an okay atom, and as the second item, a map, which is your text context, or you can just return like we're doing in this situation, the map. So you have three options for how you want to um, exit or like return or from a setup function, which is weird, but yeah, that's how we're doing it here. Um, yes. And what you can also do, which we don't use very often, maybe it's only used in a couple places and in, in any of the, the large code base is, uh, you can, if you're using doc tests, you can, if you need to do some kind of integration or accept intent test setup within your, your, um, your doc test, you can just create like an export a function from your pool case, set it up, and then go further with your things. Uh, this is just a simple function that returns a string and doesn't care about arguments. It's a really, it's a really good example of a function that someone would definitely write. Um, but yeah, that's uh, you can go hardcore and start up a Phoenix server inside of your doc test if you want to be uh, be wild with it. Have fun. Just uh, good luck with code review. So that's all with uh, with our cases. Um, something that's like I've kind of one of the members of my team, super smart guy. That's another thing. I've been working alone, uh, pretty much mostly alone on projects as a freelancer for the last decade. Um, every once in a while, I have a small team, but this time I still have, I guess, a small team. A lot of people would say, but there's like 14 developers, and most of them are very smart. Um, and so most of the time when I've work, been working alone, it's been, I've been the, the smartest and the dumbest person in the room. And it's been really, really nice to be working with people a lot smarter than me that know a lot more about this stuff where um, I have been like learning just things that I would never normally learn. And I highly recommend like to work with people that are smarter than you because it's great. Um, and this is something like, this is a gotcha that you will run into once you start doing more acceptance testing and integration testing using kind of your OTP stuff. We do a lot of things with documents. Like we have a lot of XML, we have a lot of um, CSV files because we're kind of receiving this whole picture of what the whole electric, like the, elect the, the, the network of Germany looks like or of a certain region. And we're building, we're turning that into like a network or we're turning that into a, uh, a graph and then we're saving that like in a graph database. And we're dealing with SFTP a lot of the time. Someone's dropping an SFT, a file into SFTP and we're automatically monitoring that, picking it up and then doing stuff with it. So sometimes we in our tests need an SFTP server. And once you start having to do things like that, you will start running into certain types of issues especially when you want to do things a little bit quicker, when you want to do things asynchronously, um, when you switch all of your async falses all of a sudden to async trues and all of the tests start failing for very, very strange reasons. Um, and what the problem is, is if you're starting your gen servers like this, um, where you're giving it this super easy name of the current module. Um, so you can have your public functions that just, you can call all on them and it just knows to call to this gen server because this gen server is the only one named this running in your whole system. Like maybe you have one Ecto repo that you, you don't have multiple Ecto repos that are from the same module. You have one pub sub server. It's not multiple pub sub servers that all need to be handling messages. Um, so you can just say the name is myapp.pubsub. Um, but when you're doing this, when you have more of these things that you want to be running in the same test, um, you're going to feel some pain. And in this situation, we have two test files. 
Um, let's, let's say they're two test files. I put them next to each other, I guess, maybe just to be confusing, but these are two test files and both of them are starting this does things repo by themselves. If you have just another note, let me, let me give you another note. That's something that surprised me when I heard it first is when you're running your tests async true, that doesn't mean that the test, the tests themselves in this file are running in async. All of the tests in this file are run synchronously, randomly, in a random order. Um, but what is run asynchronously is the test files. So if any tests that you have async true, any test files, those can all be run concurrently or in parallel by the test runner. Um, so in this case, we have two servers, we have two tests that are both starting this does things repo, and it's being started by a single name. Um, and this can be a real problem. And the problem is that you will end up getting an exception. In, in my case, I will get an exception because I'm using this start supervised bang function that says after there's a race condition and after one of them starts and the other one tries to start, it'll say, you can't do that. Um, we've already started this. You're out of luck. Um, tests explode. So you might ask, like, is this a real problem? It is, because if you even look into the code that's generated by Phoenix um, and Phoenix PubSub here, if you wanted to test a PubSub server that you were starting yourself in multiple tests and you were using this pattern here, you would have that same problem that I just described. And I've had this problem before and had to switch to what we're going to do next to solve this problem. So yeah, there's like advice here in the files being generated that say, it's okay to name something like this here. Um, but what can we do about this? And this is a bit strange. Um, it took me a bit to get used to it. I don't like the look of it very much because I've never experienced it in any other programming language before, but what you can do is have a default argument as your first argument. Um, and on the top all function, that's very straightforward. It's like, yeah, it's a default argument. We, we know we've had it in JavaScript, we've had it in Python, Ruby, all of the languages we've probably used being um, Elixir developers. Um, but what we aren't really used to, or I definitely wasn't used to, is this idea of having the first argument to a function being allowed to be a, a default argument. And the only thing that I would ever use this for is a situation like this, where I have a um, some kind of a server that's being started. You can default to it being named module, because normally this function, the way we would call it is genserver.call underscore underscore module underscore underscore, and then one ID. Um, but in this case, we get that, but we also get the possibility of adding a, some kind of a name to it, um, some kind of an identifier as the first argument if we need to. And the, the benefits of this is we can use our repo how we would normally use it in our application code by just calling it how we would normally call it without having to give it the server name because we've started it under the name of the module itself. So our application code doesn't need to change, but we get the benefits here that we can create a name for our server in our tests. We get the benefits of actually being able to use async true. Um, we can start our repo with, a, with this name, and then we can pass around that name in our tests. So when we call in memory repo all in our tests, we can give it this this name is our first argument. Um, and you can generate a name just by generating a UUID or a random string and turning it into an atom. Uh, if you're kind of being absolutely crazy with this in a way that I couldn't actually understand a, a real use case for, you might run into this problem where you've generated too many unique atoms and then you run out of memory, but um, in this situation, like I have one test, I probably have maybe, let's say I have a thousand tests, I'm still not going to run out of memory. Um, it's 
it's not really a concern in this testing context. So yeah, you just generate this, pass it around, and then you have access. You get that kind of for um, the, the small price of having this weird default argument as your first argument. And this has saved my butt many times in kind of these more integration, not these unit tests, but more of these integration tests that, that I've been running with using OTP. Yeah, so that's that about that. Um, the next thing that I wanna bring up is Nimble Options. And it's um, a really nice library to use. Um, it's also maintained by Dashbit. So it's cool, smart folks working on it. We know it's gonna be supported for a long time. They also sell it as being a tiny library. So um, it's probably much easier to keep up to date than a lot of other things. Um, and what it is, is it's it's essentially a way to turn your options that you're pushing into things into a schema. And I just saw this when I was uh, looking at this talk a, a little a few minutes ago, this guy is on my team here. So it's also like, we're, we're, we're supporting it as well, I guess. Um, we love it, like we use it a lot. And yes, yeah, and the way that it looks is, here is some other weird user manager example that I've created. The way that we're generally using it is we are creating this, um, this module attribute that describes the option schema of the things that are going to be um, kind of how our um, process is going to be started. Generally, a, a gen server and probably from the application file or from some kind of a supervisor. So you start the supervisor. In the supervisor, you start the this user manager, and that takes these arguments into it. And you can see this is another way to ensure this kind of name thing that I talked about in the last um, in the last section, where you can say, yeah, I actually take the name of in and in as an atom, um, and you can have defaults. So I'm defaulting to to module. So this way, I can actually. Um, yeah, I can choose when I'm starting this, what the name is, um, and then have the schema actually validated. And then you can send functions in here. Here's a function with a default. You can have required um, attributes. Uh, you can have all different, different, all different types. I, I just discovered accidentally that you can even do like a list. You can have the type be a list and the list being of a type and give it the actual list that it needs to be inside of like the, in, in, this list has to include the thing. So we did that, for example, there's, we have different groups of energy networks and um, I could, I have a, I have a function that gives me a list of the atoms of the names of all of them. And I can just put that into my, my, a list of these things that are in this list. And then in the next step, while things get validated. So this is how I would normally start my gen server. Um, and you can, you have two validate functions, a safe one, and then this bang one. And what this will do is raise a validation error. What's great also what I found out with this, um, this list that I was talking about of net groups, network groups, is that the error messages are absolutely fantastic. Like it's, tells me what the thing I tried and what the valid options are in the validation error message that it raises. So in your logs, you'll be able to see, hey, this is exactly what was going wrong. And you, you essentially get that for free. Um, you get this other thing here where Nimble Options can create documentation um, in your docs. So it will take these docs. I'm, I can't, I'm pretty sure it also maybe does something with your types. Um, I haven't looked at the documentation that it generates in a while, so I don't remember. Um, but yeah, you get this this nice function to just generate the docs for your incoming. I think that it, what it will do is when you look at your when you look at Elixir documentation, Xdoc documentation, often you have this kind of nice arguments and types um, list before the function, and this generates that for you for free. And you can also see here that I've done this. This is something that we do often. There's kind of this idea of splitting your, you have these options that you can throw into your gen server. And then you have your options that need to go into the state 
of your process that's being started, or they need to be um, in your init function. Some stuff needs to happen. Maybe you need to, for, for an example, you're starting a RabbitMQ consumer and you need the, the RabbitMQ endpoint in your init function. So you you have as one of your as one of your server options, you would have the the URL of the RabbitMQ endpoint, and then in your init function, you would take that, make a connection, and then save the connection in your process state that then you're using to listen to messages from then on. So there's this this idea of things you will work on inside of your process, and then these things that are just OTP or Gen Server related. We will use this gen, this keyword split. There's a couple other ways you can do this, um, but this is the one that I like the most. And then what you get is your first, um, your first keyword. This is two keyword lists. The first one is the things including that, and then the other thing is the the, the rest. So, yeah. So this is a pattern that we use quite often. Um, and then you also get from Nimble Options um, a type spec schema where you can. Um, create a type spec inside of your module that if you need to pass around your options into other functions and things. So dialyzer is happy. And, and then there's just like a little, this is in the docs of this function. It's you have to use unquote because of the compiler and it gets mad. So that's just something I guess to be aware of. Yeah. So um, the next topic is this is also Nimble Options related. Um, for, for testing, we're often using the Mox library. We've had issues with the Mock library, M-O-C-K, and we've been using the Mox library, M-O-X, because Mock does not do a great job with async tests. So um, we do this kind of combination of dependency injection with the options and um, using mocks in the tests. I'll show an example not using mocks, maybe a simpler example. Um, you would have your user manager and maybe you received user options. One of the options that you received could be the repo that you're using. This is maybe a, an Ecto repo or some other type of in-memory repo that you're using or maybe um, InfluxDB, whatever. And you, Create as your options, a default to being the repo that you're probably always going to use, your Ecto repo, whatever. Um, and then you can just straight up, you save this repo in your in your state of your, of your um, gen server. And then later when you need to use it, you can grab it out of your state and then call out to it like you would normally call out to it. Um, but in your tests, you can create a fake repo or you can stage this fake repo somewhere else. And this fake repo will um, have this all function as well, but it's a fake repo that you've started somewhere and you can send messages to it and then maybe receive messages back inside of your tests that these things are being called how they should be. So you're creating a, a, a mock essentially from scratch here. Um, and we can look a little bit more into the fake repo. Um, it really just takes the parent, which is, I, could, I should have called it a parent PID. It takes the PID of the test process. And then later you can send the parent process, which is the test that you're running, um, some kind of a message from it. And then inside of the test, you would start supervised your fake repo and give it self, which is the, the process ID of your current test. Um, you would then create this schema repo being fake repo, and then you can start your supervised user manager giving it um, repo, fake repo is the options to, to start it. And then it will have this repo stored inside of it instead of um, the, the, the Ecto schema, sorry, the Ecto repo. And then you can make your calls and this is a super derived answer. Like normally I wouldn't be expecting some implementation detail of my, um, of my module to be calling uh, fetch or calling all of some completely different um, process that's running or different repo. But yeah, 
if you haven't seen this in tests before, this is a common pattern that you can send your test PID to a process and then have it send messages to that PID. And then you have a couple of, uh, of assertions that you can use to, um, to listen to messages coming to the test itself. This one, this matches on the message, and then this is a timeout. So sometimes I think that the default timeout is five seconds. Sometimes that's too long. Sometimes you need infinity if you're, if you're absolutely crazy. Um, but yeah, you, you can use these things together and dependency injection works out pretty well. So I have very little time left, but I'm going to try and run through this last part. Um, there's this whole let it crash philosophy in the, in the Erlang Elixir world. I haven't actually come into having, like, I, I, I haven't used this philosophy very much. I think that on its base, what it means is we have supervisors. We can start things that are being watched. And if they crash, they get restarted automatically, um, or they don't, or the supervisor calls up to its parents. And that's essentially what let it crash means. But what, what, what the way I understood it at first is that you can just essentially kill these processes and not worry about them anymore. Their state will be cleaned up, whatever, just crash things instead of raising exceptions. And I've been one to raise exceptions and crash things at different times. But recently I came upon this, the situation that was really kind of a let it crash situation where it turns out that sometimes recovering from certain situations is hard. Um, it's sometimes much simpler to just throw the world away and then restart again. So some situations this might be in, um, maybe if you have some kind of an unrecoverable error, you just want to give up essentially and start over again. In my situation, it was, we were tracking kind of an external, external state from a process from some triggers that were happening in Postgres. And it just made more sense to crash the gen server and let it refine its state than having to recall out and listen to messages and make sure state was always consistent with the state in this remote um, database. So um, the way that you can do that is for this example, we have a gen server that's loading some complex external state and it's a init function. Um, you probably wanna do that somewhere else if that takes time. Um, yeah, and then you can kind of expose these functions. You could even do it through a public function if you wanted to. I mean, a, a public function different than handle info, where I could send this process a message, external state updated, and it probably does a nice log message telling what's going on. It cleans up any nastiness that it needs to if you have subscriptions to remote um, processes or RabbitMQ servers or um, PubHub, PubHub, <laughs> PubSub, um, subscriptions, you can clean those up. And then you can return from a, a gen server, um, this stop reason, and then the current state or, or whatever state you want to be pushed on. And this reason can be normal shutdown, shutdown term, or any other thing, but all depending on what you return, um, it's, your, sub, your supervisor will act in very, very different ways. If you return normal, um, you're not going to get a log. Um, if, your, if your restart value that you started your, your, uh, this whole supervisor with was transient, then you don't have a restart when you have normal as the, as a reason and any link processes, like if you started any tasks or any other process from within this process, or if you're monitoring anything, do not exit. Um, if you use shutdown, it's slightly different. You also don't get exits, uh, or you don't get, uh, sorry, logs. You also don't get restarts in transient mode, but the linked processes are stopped or are restarted. Um, and any other terms you've probably seen kill before, or, um, what's the other one, the really nasty one. Um, something else kill. Oh, what is it? I love it. I can't remember what it, brutal kill. <laughs> if you brutally kill it, then um, other things are going to happen. If you're in transient mode, we can look at transient mode really quick. Transient mode means that 
things will be restarted if they're if they're terminated abnormally. This means just anything other than shut down or normal. The things that we just looked at. Um, temporary means never restart it, and permanent means always restart it. So even if you have a brutal kill, it's still it's still going to be restarted if you have it in per permanent mode. So yeah. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, the I think that the the main thing that I can say about this is Elixir makes a lot of things very, very easy or simple, but the more complex your system gets, the harder testing can become. Um, of course, there's ways that I didn't show that other people use to get around that. Um, but for us, it's been pretty hard. For me, it's been pretty hard. Um, but I also think that it's definitely worth figuring out how to do it, taking the time to do it and doing it right and experimenting and learning how, I think that I've learned more about how OTP works through testing than through any other means. And it's been super, super valuable. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot. Um, it's been really great. I hope to see people in Nairobi next year. That would be amazing. And um, yeah. Thanks. Was this worth your time? Hope so. Please subscribe to stay in the loop for more of this content. In case of any queries or suggestions, feel free to hit us up on Twitter. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to ElixirCon Africa 2024. And here's the best part about this one. It'll be an in-person event. What a good excuse to come to Kenya. Again, we're super grateful for helping make this a success and definitely looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers.